The first speaker is Rudolf Enish. Uh, he's a professor of biology at MIT and a member of the Whitehead Institute. Um, he was a founder of Fate Therapeutics and is a pioneer of IPSC uh, research. And I can't think of a better way to, to kick off the session uh, than with Rudolf. So please give him a warm welcome. Hey, good morning. Um, So thank you, Dan. Um, so I would, I'm not going to talk about cancer and immune therapy. What I'd rather do is I give you a more general um, overview of the IPS technology and maybe also getting into some of the issues which we will have to, to uh, is there a pointer? Maybe not. Um, so the goal and principle of stem cell research, of course, is to use the power of pluripotent cells to generate defined models for simple and complex diseases, and then what Dan uh, really said, maybe customized, um, and generate customized cells for tissue repair. Now, the approach of all this involves conversion of somatic into pluripotent cells, uh, as you're all aware. And so, originally, two, three decades ago, we thought differentiation is irreversible, but what Dolly told us, it is reversible, and so the nuclear of differentiated cells maintain the potential to generate an entire organism. And then when you put ES cells, human ES cells, and nuclear transfer together, you come to the concept of therapeutic cloning, which was really a major issue in the late 90s and very controversial. Would it work? Could you make customized cells? And this is an uh, old experiment we did. Uh, we used direct REC2 mutant mouse, which doesn't have any B and T cells, did nuclear transfer, generated a cloned ES cell, corrected the gene, differentiated those to hematopoietic stem cells and put them in the mouse, and it restored the immune system. But if you have a human here, this is just not an option for many reasons, ethical, practical, and so on and so forth. So the only way was, of course, IPS cells, and I will really not go further into how this has revolutionized the field. So if this is a simple slide where you make uh, IPS cells from a patient who has some uh, defect um, and you can make these patient-specific cells, differentiate those, you certainly can uh, model the disease and it's not around the corner, you might be use it for cell therapy, although this is really now um, a very active area of research. I was recently at the 10 years IPS symposium in Kyoto and it was really quite a number of interesting and uh, uh, trials which are planned or ongoing. This is probably the most advanced one is macular degeneration, um, diabetes type 1, heart diseases. I think there's very, very promising results from primate studies, blood diseases, cartilage degeneration, Parkinson's, and spinal cord injury. These are all in the planning or sometimes already in the phase one state. So I think this will really um, eventually change how we do medicine. But I really want don't want to talk about transplantation. I want to talk about can you use these systems to study um, um, simple and complex diseases in the culture dish and possibly um, get insights into patho pathogenesis. And this is just an example how we would do this. Let's say you have an ALS patient. You generate ALS-specific um, IPS cells and control cells. What you want to do is then to differentiate those two motor neurons. And if you find a phenotype in the culture dish which is different from from the control, then you can ask the question, does it uh, really um, um, is similar to the, or correspond to the, what you see in vivo, and if you find that, and this is really pretty realistic, you do find these differences, then you can, of course, use the system to screen for molecules which prevent um, or slow down um, the phenotype you ha have observed. So this is very straightforward. So I'm going to talk about two topics. One is gene editing in human ES cells and IPS cells, which is absolutely crucial for the, the using this technology. And then I will give you an example of using this technology to get insights into Parkinson's disease and in monogenic and particularly sporadic um, Parkinson's, which is just an example how you would go after this, which really highlights some of the issues. So gene targeting, traditionally, but this is done by homologous recombination, as you know from Kapeki and Smithy, 
um, it works very well. And in mice, you can generate your clones. And to make a mouse, you have to inject them into a blastocyst, make a chimera, and then breed them to, for germline transmission. If things work well out, it's a year, most often two years. So this works very well. You can do anything. But it, of course, takes time. The problem, if you want to work with human ES cells and IPS cells, is it just doesn't work or not efficient enough. So alternative strategies were then first zinc fingers, then talons, and now finally CRISPR-Cas. And I'm sure you're pretty familiar with those, so let me just briefly summarize those. So zinc fingers and talons use proteins to um, recognize certain specific sequence and introduce a double strand break. CRISPR uses RNA, a guide RNA. And then again, in the, the result of Cas9 mediated cleavage would be a double strand break, which is your um, starting point to modify the genome. So we were just wondering when this technology came up a few years ago, we were wondering how efficient is that? And so we asked the question, how many genes can you simultaneously with one transfection target. And we used five genes, TET1, TET2, and TET3, and two Y-link genes, which never had been targeted by homologous recombination. And the result was, in 50% of the clones, we got all five genes were mutated, either hemizygous or homozygously. Now, of course, when you get that, you, you want to make a mouse, you still have to go through this long process of, of um, injection into blastocysts. So we asked the question, can this be done directly in the zygote? So you inject the guide RNA for TET1 and TET2 and Cas9 RNA directly in the fertilized egg. And the result was in 80% of the pups, both genes for homozygously mutated. We made these mutations also the conventional way, one after the other, and it took us uh, two years. This was three weeks in the gestation of the mouse. But you can't predict what type of mutation you get because it could be any indel of, of various unpredictable size. So could you make predetermined mutations? And for this, we injected the same RNAs plus an oligo, which has a point mutation in TET1 and TET2, and we wanted to introduce those point mutations into the endogenous genes, and the result was 60% of the pups, pups carried the point mutation in both genes. So this was really efficient. And the follow-up study was, can you insert um, genes, reporters, um, and you can, we, GFP into OC4, SOX2, and ANOC with a 10 to 30% efficiency. So it's a very trivial one day injection here for your portal line. You can make conditional mutations, um, but you have to put two LOX P sites on the same allele with a high efficiency, and you can make uh, mice with large deletions. So this technology really has revolutionized how we do this. For disease research, we can make no rodent, pigs, monkey, um, human yes, mutant yes cells. So they're monkey mutants have been made with specific mutations. In, for gene therapy, in vivo gene, genome editing works. It's known in, in, in the first trial, um, in phase one trial. Um, and combined with cell therapy, again, this is already going into, into trials. It is so efficient that, of course, one wonders, should one do this in human and the human germline? And this is a discussion ongoing, which is obviously not only a, a scientific issue, but ethical issues. So I think it revolutionizes biology, its technology. So the these research concept is really very simple, as I said before. You have to reprogram your cells or transdifferentiate those and generate the desired cell type which you want to study, and then you can disease model. Very straightforward, and many people use this. However, let me caution, give you a few cautions. This is not as straightforward as it looks. So when you think about you require patient material to do this, and you can generate your disease-specific cells. Perfect. Now comes the issue. The issue is what do, you, what do you compare them to? What is your control? And this is often ignored. And this is actually very important because it's crucial, a crucial issue because there's unpredictable differences between individual IPS cells and YES cells to differentiate to any tissue. And this is because of the genetic difference in, in the background, in, in, in genetic background. So if you get a phenotype, a subtle phenotype, you have to worry. Is it, due, is it really disease related or is it due to the system imminent um, IPSC, IPSC variation? And this is often ignored. So a number of years ago, one solution, we might make isogenic cells 
which differ exclusively at the disease-causing mutation, a point mutation, for example. So either correcting a mutation in an IPS cell or introducing the mutation into a wild-type um, ES cell with the goal to make isogenic uh, pairs of cells which you now can, can compare. So isogenic ES cells or IPS cells derive from the same embryo of the same fibroblast. Now when you work with mice, and I did a lot in my career, this is the equivalent of inbred mouse strains, and nobody in his right mind would use for most um, studies around inbred mice. So that's very important for these IPS cells. Now, the question is, does it resolve all the variation? And it actually does not. So let me give you a further caution. So I'll give you an example of hepatocyte differentiation for a project we do for Niemann Pick um, disease, which is a cholesterol um, storage disease, which also affects the liver. So when you take these cells, differentiate those to hepatocyte-like cells, takes a standard protocol, um, it takes 21 days, and you do this in in parallel cultures, and you can stain for markers. I don't want to go into the markers, and among those is alpha fetoprotein. And you can ask the question, how reproducible is that? And this is the Western, and the colors give you um, um, cells, IPS cells from the same patient. And what you can see is, why well, this one is reasonably, this alpha fetoprotein, reasonably um, reproducible. When you look at these two, so, um, IPS cells from the same genetic background. It's a huge difference in their potential to differentiate, and this is similar here. So IPS cells with identical genetic background may have vastly different potential to differentiate. Now, this is the problem when you want to use this as a readout. I'll give you another example. We're interested in Parkinson's, so synuclein is very important. If you differentiate cells from the same background for different times, 10 days over 26 days to neurons, you can see the total amount of synuclein might differ by a factor of four. So the variation is very likely due to the stochastic nature of differentiation. So in, in neural uh, differentiation, you have very varying amounts of glia to neurons, and this affects uh, and gives you this variation. You can't really predict this. So this is the problem. The other problem would be if you have a long latency disease such as Parkinson, it develops over decades, but you really you don't have decades for, for, um, for um, in, in studying this in the culture dish. If an early onset developmental disease, maybe you find a robust in vitro phenotype, this might be less of a problem. If you have a um, late onset, more subtle phenotype, I think then you expect a subtle phenotype and this might be a problem. So the experimental requirements are genetically defined control cells and a highly sensitive expression assay. So let me come to Parkinson's. So the minority of Parkinson's are familiar. We know the gene, like alpha-synuclein and uh, Parkin and so on and so forth. That's less than it's about 5%. But the majority are idiopathic. We don't know the gene. We don't know how well the, the, the genetics and so on and so forth. What's common to all of those is alpha-synuclein aggregation, Lewy bodies. That's common, so this seems to be a key, key issue here. So let me give you an example of how we studied mutations in alpha-synuclein. Um, and this is all done by Frank Solner, postdoc in the laboratory. And alpha-synuclein is key. It has many point mutations which can give rise to early onset, the dominant, early onset Parkinson. And we were interested in these two, A53T and E46K. And we wanted to generate isogenic pairs of cells which only um, in, in differ at one of these two base pairs by either introducing this mutation in the ES cells or correcting it in an IPS cell. And it was done with the, by transfection, as I said before, transfection with a single stranded oligo, which gains this mutation. And the cut was here, the zinc fingers, and the question was could you introduce this mutation at the cut site as well as further upstream, and you can. It's not efficient. But um, it works as 1%, so you have to do quite some work. But once you have those, then you have cells which don't have any genetic footprint, no LOX P site. They only have this point mutation. And so in this case, even a subtle phenotype, if you compare those, might give you confidence that it's disease relevant. But is it really worth the effort? That was a lot of work. It was uh, two years of work to, to make these. But, so I want to give you two examples. So we used this in collaboration with the Lindquist Laboratory at Whitehead to look at 
can we really uh, um, find a phenotype in culture? And when you compare, and I give you two key conclusions, compare the, um, the cells which carry the mutation with those which do not, you find early pathogenic phenotypes. And maybe more importantly, um, the system allowed us to, to verify a ubiquitin ligase small molecule which had been identified in a yeast screen in the Lindquist laboratory, so the nucleon is toxic in yeast, so they can get suppressors, and that indeed reversed the phenotype. And the other um, um, collaboration was with Stuart Lipton's laboratory, and I'll give you one example. So he found that this mutation induced nitrosative uh, stress in a transcription factor, but importantly, when you expose the cells which carry the mutation to paraquat, which is the pesticide uh, involved in, in Parkinson, then they were much more sensitive. So you can study the um, um, you can study um, environmental interactions. So this was only believable because it was genetically uh, controlled. Okay, but this is the key. The um, idiopathic sporadic um, Parkinson's it's a combination of age, genetic susceptibility, environmental factors, maybe positive family history, whole gene and GVA studies really give you hints. And risk loss are identified in these gene, gene, genome-wide association studies. So when you, so this is really a, an old quote from this paper in 2010. There are many of these GVA studies, but basically they are descriptive. We don't know in general is there what is the the, the established biological relevance is often not established. So what we wanted to use to understand mechanistically. What does a GVAS hit mean which increases your risk of Parkinson by, let's say, 3%? Most of these GVAS hits occur in not encoding regions, but mostly 95% or so in non-coding regulatory regions. So um, um, they have all the, um, um, uh, all the characteristics of an enhancer. So 90%, more than 90% of uh, sporadic forms um, are, um, of Parkinson's are sporadic. And if you look at each of us in the room has risk factors and protective factors and certain environmental exposures. And we are either patients or not. So let's assume you have this combination of risk and protective factors, you're a patient. If you have this, you are not a patient. So the point is, this is a, these are small effect size of risk loci, which interact, protective and, and, um, and risk. And that's really what determines the final outcome. How do you study that? And when you look at the alleles, the rare alleles, like A53T and synucleon, have a very high penetrance, the low frequency alleles, an intermediate one, and the common variants have a very low penetrance. So these, there are complex interactions between age, genetic risk, and environmental risk factors, and the common disease, common variant hypothesis says these factors have very small effects. So if you want to study that, the experimental requirements are very clear. We need isogenic cells. That's absolutely more important even than for monogenic diseases. He is sensitive to robust assay to distinguish subtle difference because we expect very subtle um, gene expression differences from these, um, from these variants. And we have to control for culture dish variation in the stochastic differentiation problems which I talked about. So these are the key issues to make any, any insight here. So these are the, the, the GVAS hits in Parkinson, and they are in the order of 4,000. And uh, there are many of those, and I don't want to go into these. I want to really concentrate on two risk factors which are close to the synuclein locus. So these risk variants statistically correlate with the disease. However, the majority, of course, have no, no um, established biological relevance, as I said. And as I said, they are really in non-coding regions. The real problem is if you have such a risk factor, is it really disease-causing or is it just a linkage disequilibrium? So when you look at this here, you have these risk factors here. They affect maybe some target gene from these Shiva studies. But you really, most of those are linkage disequilibrium. Maybe only this one contains the point mutation or the mutation which um, increases your risk. So for phenotypical, we need to identify specific variants. And the requirements, limitations of phenotypic variability, as I said, how we control for this and really uh, how do we set up a, re um, a robust readout 
and um, of course, um, no possibility for large numbers as in GVAS to do, to do um, um, it requires very complex manipulations. So, the, the way we approach this is using no gene editing. Assuming you have a um, control cell and you have candidate control regions here, um, which affect some gene expression, you have a patient with candidate risk variants, which are again um, 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 in regulatory regions. What we do is then using um, CRISPR-Cas exchange to re-exchange a protective of the risk enhancer. So in, in using the risk enhancers on the wild type background and the protective one on the uh, mutant background, on the uh, patient background, with the goal to make isogenic pairs of cells, which we then can compare. So that's really what, what we've been able to tell you, a little bit of progress on this. So enhancers, so these risk factors are enhancers. They have all the properties of an enhancer like DNAs, DNAs1 hypersensitivity, um, K27 acetylation, K4 methylation, and this would be, for example, in the nucleon, a typical enhancer um, um, signature, um, and there are quite a number of these these um, have, been, have been seen in these studies. So alpha-synuclein is really central, as I said before. Mutations and genomic multiplications can cause dominant familiar PD, and it's a major component of Lewy body. So it's useful if you plot the risk of, of Parkinson against synuclein expression, then maybe a normal individual would be here. If you have A53T mutation, you are dominant um, here. But more importantly, what I'm going to say is, you can have a duplication of the locus, which increases wild types of nuclear expression by 1.5-fold. That gives you familiar early onset Parkinson. So if you have a risk factor which increased by 5%, then the idea would be maybe it increase a little bit to nuclear, and a protective one decrease a little bit, certainly much less than 1.5-fold. So small size effects. So the idea was the following. If this is your, um, tar your, your candidate a risk factor, a regulatory region, and um, it will affect and cis the red and the blue allele. Of course, synuclein, you, have to, you cannot measure in ES cells. You have to differentiate them to neurons. But if these are both equal strength, then you would expect that the red and the blue allele are expressed 50-50. If you delete now the um, candidate on one allele, then you might expect, if it affects the gene, it go down by a certain fraction. And if you replace it with a Parkinson risk factor, it might go up. So the point is here, be comparing this in every cell against the unaltered uh, other allele, the blue allele. So the advantage here is, it's totally independent of total gene expression, as I will show you, and the ratio should be independent of cell heterogeneity, because you, you compare it in every cell. So that's very important. So we d developed a, um, an, an allele-specific assay, um, which is based on a SNP, which we find is in the in UT3. And I know it's very sensitive. It allows us to reliably detect 5% differences in gene expression, the ratio. So I showed you this picture before. Total synuclein expression in two different cultures might, um, might really vary by a factor of four. If you do the allele-specific assay, it's totally insensitive to the total um, expression level because you look at the ratio. So this allele-specific assay is robust and not dependent on differentiation state or homogeneity. Okay, so these are the, um, um, this is the nucleon. And upstream, 5 prime of the gene, there is a microsatellite repeat locus, which is a strong GVAS hit. And there have been quite a lot of the papers saying that these longer alleles really affect increase synuclein expression. And this was based on um, making transgenic mice with a human bug and inserting this. And when you insert with a risk allele, you have higher synuclein expression than when you have the protective allele. The problem is these genes were all integrated on different chromosomes and different copy numbers, so there were a lot of correction have to be done. So we deleted this um, microsatellite um, um, uh, locus and asked the question, does it affect synuclein? And it doesn't. And when you go through these, there are two different cell lines, no effect. So then we replaced this with all the risk 
alleles, or the protective ones, and ask the question, does it affect synuclein? No effect, and I, I don't want to go into the details here. So we find no evidence that this element affects synuclein expression. Still, it's a Parkinson risk. So we would argue there's probably some other gene, maybe far away, which we don't know. The other um, GVAS hit is in the large intron, which has all the um, properties of uh, enhancer, DNA sensitivity, uh, HKD4 methylation, H3K27 acetylation. And there are two, two elements, 68 and 54, which have all uh, our characteristics of enhancer. <coughs> so we ask the same question. When you delete now this enhancer, would you affect synuclein expression? And when you do that, now you see indeed, very robustly, you see about a 10% decrease in synuclein expression of the red allele compared to the blue allele. And again, this on two different cell lines, different type, um, times of differentiation. Okay, so then, so these are the two elements. The left element, the common allele is a G, that's a risk allele, and the A is a protective allele. And the right one, the um, risk allele is a C, and the common allele protective one is a T. So Frank made all the permutations between those, both uh, risk um, alleles or both protective ones and then um, in combination. And um, so the question was, how does it affect synuclein expression? So it was done against a double um, deletion, and then you insert all these different um, um, uh, combinations opposite of this, and these are the predictions. If there's no effect, of course, you wouldn't have any effect on synuclein expression. If only the left element is a risk-carrying mutation, then only when there's a G present would it go up. If the right one, only if there's a C. If both synergize, G and C would be more than either one of them. If you need both, then only you get an increase in in um, if both are present. So we did this experiment, differentiated them to neural precursors into neurons, and the result was really very clear. In neural precursors and in neurons, only when there's a G present, then you have a 10% increase in synuclein expression. So very clearly, what it says, this is the disease-causing mutation is the G, the A2T, and the right element is a linkage disequilibrium. Okay, so what we think then is happening is if the, the A, the protective allele, two transcription factors which we identified, AMX2 and uh, NKX6.1, bind, and this is associated with efficient, so the efficient binding is associated with synuclein expression down-regulated and decreased Parkinson risk. If you have a G here, then these two don't bind, or much less, and this is associated with reduced, so the reduced factor binding, synuclein expression is up, and this is with increased um, Parkinson risk. So both of these factors really act as repressors. And when you look in most mutants of those, indeed, the evidence consistent that they act as repressors. So the key is the risk allele increases nuclear expression by 10%. Now this makes sense, to my opinion, because for long latency disease, you have 10% more of this this, um, of this protein, you might increase your risk by 5% um, or whatever it is. So let me summarize. So common SNPs with small effect size can contribute to heritability and disease risk in these neurodegenerative diseases. CRISPR-Cas mediated gene editing really is key because it allows us to generate these isogenic cells to study these sporadic diseases. Isogenic pairs of cells carrying protective or risk alleles you can function, evaluate these regulatory elements. You can identify disease um, risk. So the challenges are, well, you would like to combine or many, as I said before in the scheme, all of these risk um, factors into one cell. You have to identify enhancers which are relevant. So it's not, from the GVAS studies, they're often done on blood cells. That's not relevant. You have to look at signatures in brain or in neurons. Of course, you need a target for an enhancer, and this target might be far away. The microsatellite repeat locus, synuclein was the closest gene, but it was not the target. Uh, and there could be more than one target. And once you have that all, you need a very robust uh, sensitive expression assay. We use this allele-specific assay. Uh, otherwise, I think you can never detect this. 
But the question is, can we really combine all, many of those into one cell, as I said before? And would they be more susceptible to environmental um, insults, like in farm workers who are exposed to pesticides? And so could you, if you combine many, could you find a cellular phenotype and study this uh, in a more mechanistic essay? But let me come in my final slide to the more general conclusions, which are important also for what we're talking today about, namely when you want to study complex diseases like cancer or immune um, responses. And monogenic versus sporadic diseases. Now monogenic ones, of course, are easy to study. I showed you this A53T mutation. But the sporadic ones are clinically much more important. They are the ones which we have to deal with. The monogenic ones may, may teach us mechanisms on a better, better scale. So the molecular understanding of sporadic diseases, such as neurodegenerative diseases, immune diseases, cancer, is really very challenging. But we have the, and I think it all goes together with this complex biology you have in those. So clearly we have challenges here, but I think we have the tools now if we are careful to, to make inroads here. So my final statement would be the IPS technology in com combination with these in, in gene editing tools really allow us to generate relevant in vitro models. So I think coming back to this slide, I believe indeed it will change um, medicine as we do to know, um, disease modeling. I think that is a, um, very, very uh, rapidly and productively ongoing. And for cell therapy, as the focus of this session is in, in eventually, I think this is um, also a re really a reality. So let me summarize the people who did all this work. It was Frank Soldner was a key person doing all this, and Jonathan Stelzer was a student, and we collaborate with Rick, Rick Young's laboratory at the Whitehead, and with Rick Meyer's group, who is a, um, a human geneticist at BU. Thank you. <laughs>